Christopher Harris Jr. was known by his loved ones as a jokester because he loved to make people laugh. At the age of 30, he lived in Kansas City, Kansas, and had a young daughter who he adored. However, he was also a trafficker of marijuana, which resulted in a long-standing, serious rival between him and some dangerous criminals. In November 2017, Christopher began receiving threats through the app Snapchat. One of the Snapchats he received were pictures of some GPS devices with a demand for $1,000 a month, along with a message that said that he was going to end up like Ryan Cobbins. Ryan was a friend of Christopher's that had gone missing four years earlier in October 2013 following a haircut appointment. In 2013, before Ryan went missing, Lester Brown, also known as Lucky, was caught underneath an orange Camaro that belonged to an associate of Christopher's and was later sold to Ryan. In another incident, Brown had allegedly impersonated a police officer and demanded the return of a GPS tracker found on a different car, also owned by Christopher's associate. After Ryan went missing, Brown would allegedly accept $20,000 from Christopher and another person as ransom payment for Ryan's return. Brown would claim that he was only acting as the middleman between the actual kidnappers and Christopher and that he could arrange the safe return of Ryan. However, two months later, on December 31, 2014, Ryan was found dead in an abandoned building from multiple gunshot wounds, with hair clippings still in his hair from his October 24, 2013 haircut appointment. Over four years later, on March 14, 2018, Christopher took his nine-year-old daughter to dance class. Afterwards, he was dropping her off at her mother's home on East 28th Street in Independence, Kansas, when someone opened fire on his car. After the first few shots were fired, he was tragically murdered after he got out of the car and yelled to them that his daughter was in the car. Afterwards, a red car was spotted fleeing from the scene. Soon after, 32-year-old Lester Lucky Brown of Kansas City was charged in connection with his murder. It was quickly determined that he didn't act alone and had ordered two men to gun down Christopher. His two co-conspirators were 29-year-old Michael Young and 32-year-old Ronell Pearson. Young was arrested on August 8 following a high-speed pursuit by law enforcement which resulted in him crashing his car. Pearson was also arrested and charged. The three men were charged in the cyber-stalking plot that led to Christopher's death. According to the indictment, the suspects had purchased two GPS tracking devices on eBay and stalked him until his murder. Two days before Christopher's death, the suspects placed a GPS tracking device on his car. Two months before his death, the men surveilled Christopher's girlfriend at her place of employment and followed her to the home she shared with Christopher. On February 2, 2018, they allegedly deployed a GPS tracking device on Christopher's other vehicle, a black Nissan Altima, and used a tracking service to determine his real-time location. Brown is also charged with one count of being a felon in possession of a firearm for illegally possessing the Glock 45 caliber pistol used to murder Christopher. He has prior felony convictions for receiving stolen property and for being a felon in possession of a firearm. He was allegedly engaged in robberies of other drug traffickers with the intent of stealing bulk quantities of high-grade marijuana and other illegal drugs to distribute himself. He had allegedly enlisted the same two shooters to assist him in those robberies as well. Christine Belford was born on November 22, 1973. She married William Maffa, and the couple had a daughter named Catherine, but the marriage would end in a divorce. Then in 1993, she began working as a receptionist in the doctor's office of an optometrist in Newark, Delaware, named David Matusiewicz. Five years later, in 1998, the couple began dating and married in 2001 before moving into a large home in Middletown, Delaware. The couple would have three daughters, in addition to Christine's firstborn daughter. Unknowingly at the time, she was marrying a man that was not only evil, but had an entire family of evil. Things became troubled when David's parents, Thomas and Lenore, moved into their home and stayed for nearly a year. 
After five years of marriage and after having their third child together, Christine would file for a divorce and was granted custody of their three daughters, Karen, Lee, and Laura. After the divorce, a family court judge considering custody of the girls ordered psychological evaluations of both parties. The psychologist who conducted the evaluations found that Christine, despite a history of depression, sought family unity and showed no signs of being a threat to her children. The report which Christine gave to the News Journal in 2008 stated she hoped to eventually restore their marriage. In his custody report, the judge referenced the psychologist's opinion that David was suffering from stress, anxiety, depression, and was at risk of losing touch with reality. David quietly sold his optometry business, forging Christine's signature to obtain a $249,000 bank letter of credit. His mother then bought a 33-foot Winnebago. David told Christine that he was taking their girls, ages 2, 4, and 5, to Disney World with his mother, Lenore. On August 26, 2007, they picked up the three girls, telling Christine they would spend two weeks at Disney World. But he didn't bring the girls back, and it would be a year and a half before they were eventually tracked down by authorities in a village called Catalina in Nicaragua. They had been told that their mother was dead. David and Lenore pleaded guilty to federal kidnapping charges in 2009, and David was sentenced to two years in prison and lost his parental rights to the girls two years later. The police believe that it was during his imprisonment that David recruited his mother, father, sister, and others to harass and slander his ex-wife. Christine would begin to endure years of harassment and online stalking at the hands of her ex-husband, David, his sister, Amy Gonzalez, who was a nurse, his mother, Lenore Matusiewicz, and father, Thomas Matusiewicz. In an effort to get custody of their children, the Matusiewicz family constantly sent emails, letters, and posted on the internet accusing her of abusing, neglecting, and even sexually assaulting her daughter. David even had his girlfriend from back in high school spy on Christine and give them information about where she lived. Then on February 11, 2013, Christine attended a child support hearing in the Newcastle County Court in Wilmington, Delaware and brought her close friend Laura Mulford along with her for support. David had traveled with his parents from Texas to the courthouse. While David went through security and into the courtroom, his father waited in the lobby. When Christine and her friend Laura entered the lobby of the courthouse, her former father-in-law, Thomas Matusiewicz, shot and killed Christine and Laura. Two officers were also injured before Thomas turned the gun on himself and killed himself on the sidewalk outside the courthouse. On the day of the shooting, the children were picked up from their school because the authorities feared for their safety. The Matusiewicz family first insisted that they did not know that Thomas was planning her murder. However, the police concluded that the group knew exactly what would happen when they went to the Wilmington courthouse. David drove to Delaware with the trunk of his car full of guns and ammunition and a list which the authorities believed was a hit list. It contained the names of Christine, a few lawyers, and the judges involved in the case. David and his sister Amy were sentenced to life after being convicted of conspiracy, interstate stalking leading to death, and cyber stalking leading to death. This is the first case in the United States where a defendant has been convicted of such a crime. Christine's eldest daughter testified in the trial against the murderer of her mother and insisted that she had never been abused by her mother in any way. David's mother was sentenced as she lay in a hospital bed. David remains behind bars, and his mother Lenore died in 2016 at the age of 71 while serving time in a Texas prison. As for Laura, Lee, and Karen, the girls were placed in the care of the state after their mother's death. Catherine, Christine's eldest daughter, stated in an interview in 2021 that she hopes to meet her sisters once again when they are a little older. The judge in the case that Christine brought against David, the protection from abuse, the original case, 
if the judge had made the right decision, my husband, my daughter-in-law, her friend, they'd be alive. And those two guards wouldn't have been hurt. Jerome Deshawn Ezel was born April 22, 1990 to Jeffrey and Rosa Ezel and went by the nickname Roni. He grew up in Lansing, Michigan and played football for the Lansing Warriors. He attended Everett High School and later attended Lansing Community College. He worked with Arctic Glacier and part-time at Tim Hortons. He also enjoyed cooking, music, and spending time with his children, family, and friends. Jerome had an infectious and contagious smile that would brighten up any room he walked in, and he also had a very inspirational sense of humor and loving spirit. At the age of 27, he was a father of seven living in Lansing, Michigan. On November 7, 2017, he reportedly dropped his girlfriend Jasmine off at work with plans to drop their baby off at the babysitter. He texted the babysitter before 10 a.m., stating that he was on his way. However, he would be abducted and would never arrive. Before 8 p.m. that night, with the help of OnStar, his vehicle was found near 1175 North Fairview Street on the corner of Grand River in Lansing, pulled into the woods east of Fairview Park. However, Roni was not in the vehicle, but their five-month-old son was found alive inside. The baby had been strapped in the car seat for over seven or eight hours. His family knew that Ronnie would have never left his baby on purpose, and if he had indeed had plans to run off, he would have dropped the baby off at the babysitter. His car was abandoned in a country club neighborhood in an area that his loved one said that he would not have chosen to be. Police searched the wooded area where the vehicle was found with cadaver dogs and with the use of night vision equipment, but could not locate him. This past year has been a painful one, but it's also made their bond stronger. And tonight they have a message for Jerome. They want you to come home no matter what the circumstances are. I really can't put my finger on it. It it's kind of feels like an out of body experience. Like It's not real. Um, seemed like it just happened yesterday. His family states that over the next year, law enforcement believed that no foul play was involved and that Ronnie had likely walked away of his own accord. There were no fingerprints found that were out of place, no sign of a struggle, and nothing from his cell phone records that would help law enforcement find any answers. His family would eventually raise enough money to hire a private investigator. On December 14, 2018, 13 months after Roni's abduction, his remains were found in the woods of Paw Paw, Michigan, which is about 20 miles west of Kalamazoo. His cause of death has not been released to the public, but it is being treated as a homicide. His family still seeks justice for Roni, and as of May 2022, this case remains unsolved. Thanks to NordVPN for sponsoring this video.